So I gotta say, I just love going in that middle segment after the top speakers in the world and after your buddies just talked about your ideas. <laughs> right, two-sided markets and uh, inverted firms. So, you know, my question is, how in the hell am I possibly going to add any value to you guys? Um, you know, to put it differently, I kind of feel like a, a duck teaching a bunch of dolphins how to swim. Um, so I'm going to try to tread water uh, a little bit, and I'm going to try to offer three ideas, some from academia, some from industry, uh, to see if we can actually make a little bit of um, headway or on a couple of different thoughts. And, you know, we can usually go through the, the normal platitudes of such things as um, you know, following your passion is one of the things that folks argue in one case. So they tell you'll do that and you'll love the result. And then you get gurus like Mark Cuban and Scott Galloway arguing, no, no, that's a terrible idea. Why? Uh, if you follow your passion, um, you know, in that case, the value, the return on investment is inversely proportional to the sex appeal. Um, so if everyone wants to do it, there's not going to be any return on value in that one, unfortunately. And so they recommend doing, following your talent um, in that. You won't necessarily love it, but you'll have a comparative advantage, as the example. So I want to change that a little bit, and I want to recommend working on the hardest problem you love. Um, so what's the hardest problem you love? It's something you really, really want to work on and really achieve in that. You may or may not necessarily be talented in it, but it's a really interesting problem. The benefits of this are, first of all, that you're going to overcome the setbacks, and there will be setbacks. How many of you know that idiot reviewer number three? as an academic. Um, so that's another challenge in there. Um, you'll also, in the process, you will become good. As we heard earlier, wonderful stories of overcoming failure, your talents will improve as you take the small steps to become better at it. Um, another wonderful example, I don't know if you know industry founder, Jack Ma for Alibaba, has these wonderful stories about having failed the middle school exams, having failed the high school exams, having failed the college exams, having failed the police entrance exams. When KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, came to town, 24 people interviewed, 23 got the job. <laughs> and yet, he's the one that founds Alibaba in here. It's really quite an extraordinary set of accomplishments. And his observation was, each setback is just an obstacle. It's only a failure when you give up. And so we've done an amazing job in actually setting this up. Um, there is a cost, by the way. So I will mention that if you follow the hardest problems that you love, the answers don't come easily, and they don't come on schedule. So it is a cost that you do have to be aware of. It's a downside. Um, in personal experience, you know, if I'd had to put in the original 10-year packet, as we talked about in, in Ann Arbor, I didn't have a lot of famous papers at that time. There wasn't anything there. It would have been a really hard time uh, at that. I changed institutions. Um, so answers don't necessarily come on time and they don't come easily. The second thing I'd like to uh, argue, so the first was work on the hardest problems you love. The second is invest in the people and the institutions around you. Um, there are a couple of different examples of this that I think are valuable. So again, if we return to Alibaba, the chief strategy officer, Ming Zheng, talks about solving the weak partner paradox. So what is that? When you're getting started, you want the strong partners who can carry you. But the problem is they don't want to carry you. Um, the weak partners, partners want you, but they can't carry you. So that's the problem. And so his recommendation was to invest in the weak partners, those small firms, and you'll carry each other as needed. And you'll actually be more successful in the long term. And that's what they did. They built these large institutions that managed to scale all across China, building networks of small suppliers. And I can tell you from personal experience, when Jeff and I started out, we didn't have the, pay the papers, we didn't have the doctoral students, we didn't have the money, we didn't have the reputations. But we carried a lot of time together. Um, you know, whether we changed institutions or parents passed, each of us would pick up the slack. Um, I'd also point you to some of the work, so that's on the platform slide, uh, but I also point you to some of the work of Francis Fry is going to speak later on great leaders of people that invest in the people around them and make them better. Uh, so that actually, I think, is something I would invite you to listen to. And I think that'll be one of the more valuable sets of insights. But the third set of ideas I want to really bring to your attention is focusing on the basics. 
there's some real insight to be had by focusing on the basics. I want to get, I'll start with an industrial example, and I want to finish with an academic example where I think we can actually make some headway. So in uh, Jack Ma's Ant Financial, focusing on the basics was giving loans to average people that couldn't get them. The banks would focus on small industry. Giving uh, credit and investment opportunities to small individuals, huge opportunity across China. And from this, they built this you know, you know, enormous institution that's so successful, the government is now taking them apart because they've become, in some sense, almost a political threat that they've become so powerful. And the common people love them for that. It's interesting to know how they started. When small merchants would try to sell to others in a city, there was no financial mechanism to connect one party to another. So there's a small motorcycle story. So a buyer might show up with the good to meet a seller that they had met online uh, on Alibaba. And then what would happen is the buyer would show up on a motorcycle, snatch the good, and drive away. So what happens? Alibaba set up an escrow service that became a payment service and financial. So it was, again, solving a social problem back to the original question. So our version of that in academia recently is working on the fake news problem. And I, this is a really interesting one. I find, one I find personally challenging is really problematic. We can't, you know, if we can't agree on the problems of global warming, who's president, whether vaccines work or not, we've got serious challenges. So returning to basics, uh, I would argue that the fake news problem can be recharacterized from what most folks think that it is. I'd like to characterize it as misinformation causes externalities. These are the insurrections, the vaccine hesitancy, the genocide that happen off platform. This is damage that's occurring in the community that's not internalized by the platform. But here's why this is a problem. Externalities cause, in economics, what are market failures. Market failures require intervention, but intervention is forbidden by the First Amendment. Now we're stuck. The reason is the courts turn the problem over to the marketplace of ideas, but the markets can't self-correct market failures. So how do we do that? Well, focus on the basics. What are the fundamentals? I want to give you a hope. I believe, based on research, that it is possible to reduce the misinformation problem with no censorship whatsoever and no central authority. Not government, not firms like Facebook, not powerful individuals like Elon Musk. Why would you think this is true? Well, we'll start with the basics. I don't know how many of you know the fundamental welfare theorem of economics, but the idea is that buyers and suppliers acting in a marketplace will compete their way in their own self-interest to a social optimum. Uh, and this is an idea that goes all the way back to Adam Smith, where the, the brewer, the butcher, the baker provide supper, not from interest in uh, beneficence, but in their own self-interest. And it's an idea that was actually then proven formally by Pareto and by Arrow. And the idea simply is that markets do better than centrally planned economies. But here's the catch. That's only true if there are no information asymmetries and there are no externalities. And we just said in misinformation, there are both. But if we go back to basics, we have tools for both of those. So we have tools from Akerlof, Spence, and Stieglitz to deal with the information asymmetries. And we have tools from Ronald Coase on dealing with externalities. So if we can assign property rights, if we can increase the rights of speakers and of listeners in the right way, then it's possible to create something more like a Spence Coase marketplace, a market for truth in which we can actually reduce misinformation without censorship and without central control as a way to do that. So in this sense, the market for truth ought to do better than a centrally planned determination. So that's the connection for the dots. With that, we have 40 seconds left. So that's the end of our time together. So I'd like to say this is a 10-minute swimming lesson, OK? Um, so if you would like more, uh, I'd be delighted to talk to you afterwards on any of these details. Or there is a paper on free, free speech and the fake news problem, and that will have a lot more tips on how to do the duck paddle. So I look, thank you for your time. Thank you. Marsh, we have uh, one question. Um, posed this way. It'd be interesting to channel in your parents 
in this conversation, right? So you should talk to Marshall about his mom and dad. They figure something in his interest in misinformation. How can we strike a balance between promoting free speech and preventing the spread of harmful misinformation in online platforms and communities? So um, I'll give you a different answer than the one from here, but I think there actually is a way to do this. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Section 230, which is the current law that absolves platforms from the content their users generate, in addition to absolving them from their editorial decisions on that. Um, interestingly, I do believe this creates just a new conflict where we've turned over the protections that were afforded by constitutional free speech right to let platforms decide our rights because they can leave up or take down our speech as they determine and they have effectively become the marketplace for ideas. So I would actually solve that particular problem in uh, two ways that I believe can both protect free speech and reduce the harm. So I would first step separate the original post and protect that more than is currently protected. So this often responds to the conservative objection about having your speech taken down or people treated unequally. Uh, and platforms do treat people unequally. So I would want to leave up the original and actually treat people more equally than is the case. But I then might hold platforms accountable for the amplification, the algorithmic spread. You know, to put a finer point on it, I sometimes think the original speech provides the spark, then the platform pours on the gasoline and burns down the neighborhood so they can sell ads while people watch the fire. So in a sense, what I would then do is I would hold the platforms accountable for the amplification in there which we can do on a statistical sampling basis, not an individual message basis. And that then brings us back to data science, but we can know to any level of certainty we desire that they have communicated terrorist activity or sex trafficking or illicit drugs and they actually then hold them accountable. So I think it's possible to do both protecting free speech and reduce the harms. This is an ambitious project that Marshall has been working on for a while and it's uh, very needed in our society. So thanks Marshall. Thank you.